No fear can stand up to hunger. No patience can wear it out. Disgust simply does not exist where hunger is. And as to superstition, beliefs, what you may call the principles, they're less than chaff in a breeze. That's from Joseph Conrad's great short story of 1902, Heart of Darkness, in which he writes out of his experience on a river steamboat on the Congo River in the heart of Africa. He went there deliberately to try to experience hunger and corruption and other evils and to find what he calls darkness in himself. And that's what he found there. He writes about it as he never had before. Not all trials are inward, as those Conrad describes. There are many trials. In fact, there seem to be as many trials as there are people. Everyone this morning has walked in here with certain trials. There's hunger and poverty, surely. There's also loneliness. There's hopelessness. There's a family falling apart or a society breaking down. As Christians, surely those of us who come here this morning as believers in Christ know the trial of all trials to our soul is our sin. The ways we live contrary to the God that we say we love and worship with all of our lives. Ironically, such troubles are the stuff of good stories, we have to admit. I mean, who wants to read a story about how Mary got up and had a great day? We just don't. I mean, there at least needs to be a little threat, a little danger, a little moral ambiguity or tension, even if we Americans like to have it resolved by the end. Authors always say that it's easier to describe evil in a novel than it is to describe good. That it's easier to create and bring to life a a bad character rather than a virtuous one. There's depth and texture to evil characters that seems lacking in our portrayal of good ones. The character of evil is more understandable to us, more explicable, more real. We all have experience with troubles and trials, with difficulties and defeats. Such experiences seem to be the stuff out of which the best stories are made. Well, the book of Ruth in the Old Testament is a tremendous story. It's a story set in dark times. But there are no bad characters in Ruth, unless that is, it's God himself. And that's the question of the book. Many of you will know the story of Ruth from Sunday school days. It's a brief story, only four chapters long. It's one of only two books in the Bible named after a woman. And the only one in the Old Testament named after someone who wasn't Jewish. You'll find it in the pew Bibles that are here in the main hall, starting on page 276. And in the West Hall and the Pew Bibles on 258, the book of Ruth in the Old Testament is our study this morning. Let me invite you to open there. Follow along with me. People have suggested many reasons for this book being written. Some have seen it as a plea for racial tolerance. Ruth Ruth was a Moabite, after all. Others as a call, a plea for family responsibility. Some have seen it as a story to show the importance of individual faithfulness, even in times of widespread immorality. Others have suggested that it's simply an encouragement to show that God rewards wisdom. Some have said that it's a story to show the influence of godly women. Others that it's such a beautiful story, it really has no purpose at all other than just telling it, because it is such a beautiful story. Well, I think all of these may have aspects of what this book is about. Though there are other ways I could put it, I think that this story is about kindness and mercy. Look with me at it. The story, as I say, is set in very dark times. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women. 
one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Well, this story takes place, as it says here in the very first phrase, in the days when the judges ruled. Now, we thought about those days last week, those of you who were here last week, and we saw that by and large they did seem to be bleak days. Some people have taken Ruth as sort of the last installment in the book of Judges, almost a continuation, the last section. Well, in the dark setting of this book, in the days of the Judges, this story shows two things that we want to notice. And if you're taking notes, this is the outline. First, we want to notice the many displays of human kindness. The many displays of human kindness. And then, I want us to see the argument that this story is for God's kindness. That's the second point. The argument for God's kindness. And who knows what surprises God may have for you this morning in this well-known little tale. First, notice that this story is a display of human kindness. In the midst of these trying circumstances, lives characterized by, at least in part, by kindness were being lived. Look down with me in chapter 1, verse 6. Let's continue reading a little more, and I think you'll see this. When she, that is Naomi, when she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grow up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you. Because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this, they wept again. Look there up in verse 9 at Naomi. She described the support that she had received from Orpah and Ruth. By what word? Kindness. And she had thanked God for it. In her trials, she had known kindness from her daughters-in-law. Naomi too was being kind. She prayed for both her daughters-in-law there in verse 9, mentioning the kindness that both had shown to her. And her prayer here, at least for Ruth, that she would find rest in the home of another husband, her prayer was going to be answered, though in a way that I think Naomi would have had no idea about at the moment when she was praying it. So Orpah is being kind and supportive, and Naomi is being kind and is trying to look out for the good of others, but an even greater kindness is about to be shown by Ruth. And you could say that this is the reason this book is named after her. Look there again in the middle of verse 14. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. Now, Ruth here, in her kindness, has to first overcome what must seem like almost anti-evangelism from Naomi. Did you notice that? Uh, A number of you asked me about it this week. Uh, There, Naomi is insisting in verse 15 that Ruth and, and Orpah go back to the Moabites and to their gods. Go back with her. Naomi implores Ruth there in verse 15. 
Now, I don't know what all Naomi meant by that. I know that Jewish rabbis have said that Naomi here is a model for what to do with proselytes, those wanting to convert to Judaism. Uh, They said that from the model of Naomi, we're to learn that we should rebuff them three times to see if they're sincere, to test them. And then, still, if they come along, at least they've learned that it's hard to be a Jew. That's what the rabbis say from the example of Naomi. Well, think what you will about it. I myself am not persuaded that Naomi was trying to teach or evangelize or anti-evangelize Ruth. I think she was simply trying to be considerate and was sincerely fearful about not being able once in Bethlehem to support herself, let alone Ruth. So she just didn't know how she could help. Naomi dissuaded one daughter-in-law successfully. Orpah turned back, but not the other. This shows they weren't forced in any way. One was freely choosing, even against some opposition, to make this decision. An old comment on the two thieves at Calvary says, One was saved that none might despair, but only one that none might presume. Well, here these two daughters-in-law stood at the crossroad. They stood there with a choice to make, and Orpah turned back. And she went back to serve the gods of her fathers. But Ruth went on with Naomi. A journey of probably about 50 miles from Moab to Judah. But a journey far more important than its simple distance would suggest. You should understand here that in leaving her own people and going back to Bethlehem with Naomi, Ruth was showing great kindness to Naomi. Great kindness, even as she would later show kindness to care for Boaz, who was considerably older than her. Boaz, too, is marked by kindness, as we'll see as we keep reading through the story. I mean, this book is absolutely full of human kindnesses. And so are our lives. We should just stop and note. Notwithstanding the worst things that may happen through terrorists or war, through unemployment or ill health, during times of social decay or personal trial, We would be lying if we did not say that there continues to be kindness shown to us. Not by everyone always, but often, and by many people. I can tell you that as a Christian, I'm not surprised by that. I understand that we are all made in the image of God, Christians and non-Christians, and that regardless of our religion, age, education, or nationality, that image is just going to show itself sometimes. People are going to do wonderful things. They're going to be kind. They're going to be caring. And therefore, I'm not surprised at all by stories of kindness, even though I do believe in what we Christians call depravity. I do believe that all of us are by nature sinful. I believe that we're fallen. I still believe even though we're fallen, we're made in the image of God. And therefore, you have people who act horrendously and yet can have aspects of kindness in their personality. Well, I don't know how you deal with that, particularly if you're here as an unbeliever this morning. But I can tell you that as a Christian, I'm not surprised by that. I'm grieved by the horrendous actions, by the sins. But as a Christian, I understand both. I think I understand something of why they're both there. I'm not surprised because I know that though we're sinful and fallen, we're still made in God's image with a capacity to know him and reflect something of his character. I particularly hope on this Memorial Day weekend that those of you in public service will realize this. Our Christian faith and conviction that everyone needs the gospel in no way should undermine the importance of what you do when you encourage people in the workplace or in the public life in government or in other ways to make possible aspects of our life that everyone benefits from, whether Christians or non-Christians. Or a more civil society will never replace the gospel, but they are worthy things to do for people who believe the gospel. And we should thank God for everyone who's working for the good of society as a whole. As a church, as a congregation, we should certainly encourage care for our more vulnerable members, kind of like Naomi and Ruth were here. We should pray for Jim and Freddie as they uh, work as deacons of member care, uh, as they care particularly for those members of our congregation who are in a certain need or who are older and need help. We should pray for the Angels Free Outreach and get involved with it. You can talk to, to Shelley or Carl afterwards if you want to know more about that. 
Pray for relationships that you may have with those in need. And pray that we as a church become better at this, that we become more obedient in this area, that we're better able to reflect God's character in caring for those who are poor and needy and vulnerable. And friend, friend, I hope that you realize it is good to be kind to others. I hope in the whole shuffle of Christian virtues, that one hasn't gotten left out. That's a great virtue. Paul tells us in Galatians 5 that that's one of the fruits that God's Spirit bears in the personalities of those who are really his children. Kindness. And I can understand why. As one writer said, to put on kindness is to clothe ourselves with the very character of God himself. But now that brings us to the point at issue in this book itself, the very point. In some ways, as I've read and reread and reread and reread this book this week, this book seems to lay out a challenge. Are people kinder than God? Are people kinder than God? From Orpah and Ruth, Naomi here experienced great love and care. But what about from God? Well, let's rejoin the story in chapter 1 and verse 19. When Naomi and Ruth have completed their two or three day journey back to Bethlehem. Verse 19 in the middle. When they arrived in Bethlehem. The whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Naomi means sweetness in Hebrew. Don't call them Naomi. Call me Mara. Because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Naomi says in verse 21 that the Lord had brought her back to her home empty. Of course, she had Ruth, and Ruth would actually be the key to all the other things that Naomi didn't have right now or didn't see right now. Uh, Naomi's eyes are fixed on the very real reasons that she had to complain. And she had some very real reasons, if you think about it. I mean, she and her husband had experienced famine. Now, my guess is few, if any of us here this morning, have experienced that. But how terrifying it must be to begin to wonder whether you'll have enough food to feed your children with. Or to eat yourself. It was so bad that Elimelech took his wife and two sons and left Israel. He kind of exiled himself. And he, where did he go? He went to live with the Moabites, not exactly Israel's historic friend. But so desperate he was because of this famine. And did you ever think, how was that for Naomi? How was it trying to bring up those two young boys out among the Moabites in a foreign land and in that foreign land? And then, in the midst of all that, to have her husband die? The one who had led her out there? I wonder how vulnerable she felt. And then, her sons marry local girls. Well, did she know that that was against the law of God? If she didn't, pity her ignorance. If she did, lament her sin. Either way, it wasn't good. And then to have one die before he'd been able to father a son. And then to have her only other son die again before he'd fathered any children. And so she had now endured the death of both sons. And with them, her husband's name would fail. It would vanish into oblivion. And all of her life's labors seemed to have been for nothing. She was, in that sense, the definition of a failure. Now, these are some of the reasons that we know of that Naomi had to complain. But thank God that he is faithful to be working blessings, even in the midst of our complaining. 
Do you notice that here? Even while we hear her complaining in verse 22, the narrator sort of directs our eyes over to Ruth and to the barley harvest. Before we go on with the story, you should just stop and think for a moment. How's your complaining this morning? One thing I've noticed, even among people who call themselves unbelievers, there seems to be an unstoppable reflex to ask why when difficulties come into their lives. Have you ever noticed that? People who never go to church, who claim no religious faith, maybe even who claim to be atheists, when something terrible happens in the world or devastating in their own lives, or maybe just difficult, they ask, why? As if they're assuming somewhere back there that there must be some kind of purpose. Friends, I'm not surprised at that at all. I think it's because they're made in the image of God. If you're here as a non-Christian this morning, I would encourage you to see that as a part testimony that what we're saying here is true. And I would encourage you to talk to me or one of the other pastoral staff at the door as you go out today. In his great hymn, God Moves in a Mysterious Way, William Cooper shows appropriate reticence to judge God's ways by what we can see in the present alone. When you look through the hymn, it's, it's in every line. Storms are things God rides on. The clouds we dread and complain about bring big mercies for God's own people. We see in time only a frowning providence, but behind it there's a smiling face that later appears. Unbelief is blind and can't read God's works. God himself, in the course of his actions over time, will make it plain. Friends, we cannot read God's providences when we are in the middle of them. We've never been able to, and we never will. The only reason we can even read Ruth's life like we can is because we have this inspired record of it, where God himself has interpreted it and has left it for us for our instruction. So how are you with difficult and trying times? It's a very practical question. James tells us, consider it pure joy, my brothers. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. My Christian friend, don't you know better than to conclude that you've seen the end of what God's up to in your life? Of course you haven't. So don't lash out at the people around you like you have. No, that's God's work. He knows what he's doing. Do you really think he's all done now? Do you think he's really lived now to the end of his plan? Are things so complete and over and finished? Do you really think that he's completed everything he has to do in your life? Friends, one of the delights I have in being a Christian and in knowing the Lord for a number of years is being able to see time and time again when I would worry and get upset over something, God's faithfulness in bringing about his good purposes in the lives of his children. I understand something of what a person meant years ago who said affliction is a good man's shining time. It's true. Anybody can look calm when everything's going the way they want. Ah, but you let afflictions come. And then you see what we've really been serving. Have we really been serving our good circumstances? Or have we really been serving our loving, sovereign, faithful, unchanging Lord. May God teach each one of us and us as a church to endure in trust whatever difficulties we may face for a time. Well, this story is more than just an account of human kindness, though. At root, I think, this story is an argument for God's kindness. And this is the second point. It is an argument for God's kindness. It's not just a display of human kindnesses, though there are plenty of those in the book. It is an argument. And it is an argument that God is kind. It is, if you will, a small, dramatic Job. Only where Job has the blessings at the beginning at the end... Uh, and his trials are reflected on throughout, Ruth only mentions the trials very fleetingly in the beginning, in the first chapter. And then you have a brief, concentrated, really elegant story of blessings. Blessings in which God is seen to be active. Also, you know, in, in Job, 
God's vindication only seems to affect one family, the family of Job. But in Ruth, God's vindication will affect us all. So, Naomi had left Judah hungry and earlier, maybe ten years or more earlier, gone into Moab. The question before her now was, would she now, as a widow, with no husband and no sons to support her either, because those have died, would she once again find herself hungry, even back in Bethlehem? You'd think so, from the way she was talking at the end of chapter 1. But then there was Ruth and the barley harvest. Let's look at chapter 2. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then... Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, whose young woman is that? The foreman replied, she's the Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She went into the field and has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting, and follow along after the girls. I told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She exclaimed, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. And how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with the people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have given me comfort and have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Even if she gathers among the sheaves, that's the grain already gathered, don't embarrass her. Rather, pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up. And don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered And it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she'd gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she'd eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He, referring to the Lord, has not stopped showing kindness to the living and to the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with his girls, because in someone else's field you might be harmed. Ruth stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Here we see clearly that God worked through Boaz to provide Naomi and Ruth with food. From the very beginning, Boaz shows a very kind concern for Ruth. If you look there in verse 8 of chapter 2, you know, Boaz immediately speaks to her when he sees her in a very fatherly fashion, advising her, even inviting her to feed from his harvests. And so, as it says there in that last verse of the chapter, she stayed gleaning in Boaz's fields until the barley and the wheat harvests were finished. So she was probably there for a couple of months, from maybe late April through May into June, most of June, gathering food. You can never tell all the future results of present faithfulnesses, regardless of how small they may seem. 
And so Ruth and Naomi were fed. Ruth had worked hard, of course, to make sure that Naomi had something to eat. We see that here in chapter 2 as she brings food home and she does it again in chapter 3, the great bountiful provision that she brought to Naomi. But in all of this, what we're to see is the activity of God. God is being vindicated from the charge that he did not care for Naomi and for her hunger. For one thing, I mean, you see God's law at work. It was God's law that provided that some of the harvest was to be left for the poor to pick up or glean after someone else had cut it. Gleaning is just going along and picking up what's left. And in God's law, in several places, it said that the harvesters were supposed to leave some. It says, don't cut to the edge of your field so that the fatherless, the alien, and the widow will have something to pick up. So they'll have something to eat. So it was the Lord's law that had provided that. Also, it was the Lord himself who's sovereign over the weather and over the harvest. I mean, for all of its darkness, chapter 1, remember, ends on a notice of hope. I mean, you noticed that, didn't you? They're arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Naomi was perhaps wise in when she had chosen to go back to Bethlehem. And, of course, this whole lack of food that had begun a decade earlier had some spiritual significance. Back in chapter 1, verse 2, when we read that Elimelech had led his family to Moab to seek food, what we see spiritually is an avoidance of repentance. When you read Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, you find that God talks about famine, and he would send famine on his people if they were disobedient. So what Elimelech should have done was to help lead his family and Bethlehem in repentance and trust God to provide for his people. But instead he dodged that. He avoided dealing with it spiritually, and he decided to deal with it simply physically. Now, Naomi had some understanding of this. The very way that it's represented that the famine ended back in chapter 1, did you notice the verbiage? It's the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them. They were aware that it was the Lord that provided food. So this little story serves as a reminder that the Lord is good and that he does give food. Naomi recognized this. I mean, notice what she said the first day that Ruth came home and told her whose field she was in. There in chapter 2, verse 20. He, the Lord, has not stopped showing kindness to the living and to the dead. Naomi recognized that the Lord was behind this provision. And that recognition, I think, as I read the book, was a kind of turning point in her heart. All of a sudden, her heart follows, maybe more slowly, but it follows behind the decision that her mind and will had made to return to God's land and to live among God's people under God's law. It's a quiet realization, perhaps, that this story is about God's providence for his own. But so it is. Only in this book of Ruth, God doesn't take center stage with miraculous works or great prophets. There are none of those here. No. No. But start noticing who provides the loving care that is so faithful to his own throughout the book. Of course, Naomi's trials weren't merely about food. She was also destined, it seemed, to be alone. And therefore, she would always be threatened by ruin or destitution just around the corner. And that's where finding a husband for Ruth comes in. And this is really the center of the story. We begin reading chapter 3, verse 1. One day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been, a kinsman of ours? Tonight he'll be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you're there until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he's lying, and then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I'm your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You've not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. 
All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am near of kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Stay here for the night. And in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good, let him redeem. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until the morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you're wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there. When the kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along, Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here, and they did so. Then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth the Moabitess, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the kinsman redeemer said, Then I cannot redeem it. Because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Malon's widow, as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Today, you are witnesses. Then the elders and all those at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And so there it is. There's the story. In chapter 1, you have the introduction and the end. In chapter 4, you have the conclusion. But the rest of the book, really, if you think about it, is all about two days in Ruth's life. Two key days. Chapter 2, the day she was fed. And chapters 3 and 4, the day she was wed. That's the book of Ruth. Two days in the life of Ruth. Two key days. Now, about this wedding, Naomi certainly had a hand in it. I think that's an understatement. Some have wondered if Naomi wasn't being a bit too scheming here. But after considering this, I think I want to defend Naomi. Perhaps she was being too scheming, but she did have a responsibility. She had a responsibility for her husband's name to raise up an heir for him and to provide for her daughter-in-law. So what she was doing when she was giving Ruth all that, you know, knowing advice, she was telling Ruth what to do in order to fulfill those obligations. Because, you see, in that culture, there There was no police force. There was no formal court. There was no town official or welfare officer you could go to see. You simply had to go straight to those who could help you. And that's what Naomi is wisely advising Ruth on how to do. So that's what Ruth did. Ruth, of course, had a large part in getting a husband. After all, she had chosen to come to Bethlehem and to be with her mother-in-law. She had chosen to make sure that Naomi was not left alone. She had chosen what field to work in. She had conducted herself honorably when she first met Boaz in chapter 2. And then in chapter 3, she followed her mother-in-law's instructions and went. She approached quietly, uncovered Boaz's feet and lay down. Now, let me just say here, some people have wondered if the author is being a bit coy here and if what Ruth really did at this point was to seduce Boaz. But the text doesn't seem to support that. Instead, it seems that immediately Boaz understood what she was doing was honorable. And she was appealing to him perhaps to be her husband, but at least to be her protector. Because if you think of who she was, she was a childless widow. There wasn't anyone to protect her, so she had the right according to to Jewish law, the law that God had given in the Torah to Moses. She had the right to ask a near relative to be her protector. 
And so, being advised by her mother-in-law to do this, Ruth turned to Boaz and asked. So on the one hand, Ruth is taking a lot of initiative here in a relationship with a guy. No question. On the other hand, the situation is quite unusual and special. And, of course, Boaz, too, had a part in this. He was clearly interested in Ruth from the first moment he saw her, you know. And so in chapter 3, he agreed to spread the corner of his garment over her, not uh, sort of hiding sexual immorality, but as a sign of accepting her for protection. That word that's translated garment is the same word that Boaz used in 2.12. Chapter 2, verse 12, that the NIV has translated wing in chapter 2. In 2.12, Boaz had said to Ruth, May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. It's the same word for garment. Spreading his wings over to protect. Now, Boaz himself is becoming the answer to that prayer that he prayed for Ruth in the previous chapter. So in spreading his garment over Ruth at the corner of his garment, sort of like a, a mother hen spreads her protective wings out over her chicks, Boaz is symbolizing a commitment to her. And in this story, that means it seems to mean a commitment to pursue marriage. That would be the way she would be protected and cared for. And this is a common image in the Old Testament. In Psalm 104, verse 6, the psalmist presents the whole earth as being under God's protection. With the oceans, the psalmist says, spread out like his garment over the world. To show that it's God who takes responsibility for the world. And the Lord says in Ezekiel 16 to his people, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. So what Boaz did here, what he was being asked to do, was really an extension of what's called Leverite marriage. And it was being asked also to act as a kinsman redeemer. The marriage had more to do with raising up children. According to Deuteronomy 25, a brother was to take responsibility to see that uh, the other marriages that the brothers had produced offspring, because if they died childless, then uh, there would be no one to continue his name in Israel. Well, in this situation, Naomi had no more sons. There were no other brothers to do this for Ruth. But Naomi's late husband, Elimelech, had relatives in Bethlehem, and Boaz is one of those. So he's acting in that way. And there's, there's also this role of kinsman redeemer, which isn't exactly the same thing. According to Leviticus 25, Numbers 35, the kinsman redeemer was the person who was supposed to restore property that family members had had to sell due to poverty. They needed some money to live on, and they weren't. They, they were to make sure that no one became landless. That there became a kind of cycle of poverty. So it was a kind of inside the clan welfare where you accept and discharge the debts and obligations of other family members. And you did that so that they could be free. Or if they had fallen into some kind of slavery from debt, be restored. Well, this is the kind of redemption that's going on here. It's the kind of redemption that the Lord had, had done for Israel. He says through Isaiah, you will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior, your Redeemer. Well, now Boaz, at night on the threshing floor, Boaz was offering, after he'd been asked, Boaz was offering to be that redeemer for Ruth. Well, the next morning in the town square, Boaz acts exactly as Naomi, knowing him, knew he would. He acts quickly on his family obligations and through some honest, though true, shrewd moves. The one kinsman closer than Boaz shows some interest in the property. You know, Boaz very wisely brings out the good point first. You know, oh, well, it's very nice, you know, and then ends with a negative. Oh, but there is this. Hmm. You know, <laughs> Boaz was clearly a man of good standing in the community. Well, Boaz does this and he brings him over and, and the guys, the other kinsman closer than him says that he's not going to do it. And so Boaz is able to announce that he will publicly take uh, Ruth as his wife. And his wishes come to their fulfillment there in chapter four, verse 13, where we read. Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. So, friends, Naomi and Ruth and Boaz are all very clever in this. But I hope you don't miss the fact that it was the Lord who was behind this wedding. Naomi must have known it. Remember, back in chapter one, verse nine, she had prayed to the Lord that he would do exactly this for Ruth. That she would find rest in the home of another husband. And now she had. Naomi certainly knew that understanding God's sovereignty in no way disallowed concerted effort on her part. So she believed God was sovereign. She was also quite active herself in trying to push things along to what she was sure would be a good conclusion. 
But for all of her planning, I just want to point out here, she knew that the outcome was from God. She was very clear on that. That's why she prayed as she did. Now, beyond hunger and loneliness, there is too hopelessness. Would God also provide a future for the family with children? We'll keep reading in verse 13 of chapter 4. Then he went to her, Boaz, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. And this is really the climax of the story for Naomi, isn't it? Little baby Obed, lie, lay, laid there in her lap. Again, she has an heir. Again, she's placed her hope in God. And now she can see her hopes there in little baby Obed. And the women living there recognize this. They say, Naomi has a son. Now, of course, once again, Naomi had schemed for this, certainly. And Boaz and Ruth had acted for this. But God, though he used all of those again throughout this story, God is the one who ultimately gave this child. Look there in chapter 4, verse 13. The Lord enabled her to conceive. It was God who was so good and constant in his loving kindness for his own. So as not only to provide food and a home, but even a future family for Naomi and Ruth. And were these simple islands of individual blessing in a sea of bad? I mean, could any of this really matter with society disintegrating all around them, seeking into a morass of immorality? Well, let's see who this child is. This child was Obed. Who's Obed? Well, look there in chapter 4, verse 17. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. They may have been living in the times of the judges, but God would use this little family to move them to have a king, and that a king after God's own heart. And don't forget that all of this was from a Moabite woman. And what's going on with that? The Moabites, I mean, these people were terrible. They, they had been the ones who had sent Balaam to prophesy against them when they came. They had been the ones who first seduced the sons of Israel into worshiping false gods. What is, what is he doing here blessing a Moabite like this? Elimelech in taking his sons over there to Moab. And Naomi in letting his sons marry Moabite women had clearly transgressed God's law. Now when Boaz married Ruth in our story, though, there were more factors to consider. Ruth wasn't just a Moabitess. She was also a widow of an Israelite husband. And God has a special concern for widows. So is there this law over here? Yes, there is. But my friend, as is always the case with laws, and then there's this one over here. There must be judicious weighing. And not only that, but she was also a landless alien in Bethlehem. And God's law makes a special provision for them, as we've seen. And perhaps most of all, she was a woman who seemed to have sincerely desired to follow Yahweh, follow the Lord. And take refuge in him. So like Rahab the Canaanite before her. She seems to have been genuinely converted. And incorporated into the people of God. She left everything she knew in Moab. To follow what seemed like it was going to be a fruitless path. Why? Well the plain meaning of chapter 1. Would suggest that it was out of love to Naomi. And love to Naomi's God. In chapter 1 verse 16. Ruth said that she was choosing Israel's God. And in chapter 2, verse 12, Boaz recognized her as having done this. Naomi, too, was choosing to return to God's land and God's people in chapter 1. That word for return is used again and again, and it's the word which throughout the Old Testament that's used to mean repent. So Naomi and Ruth were both choosing to turn away from evil and to turn to God's people. His laws, his provisions, 
and in all this to the Lord himself. So, friends, God centered his plans on the Israelites, but only in order to create something for all the nations. For Moabites like Ruth and Canaanites like Rahab and all the rest. For Jews and Gentiles. For you and me. That's why God had focused his plans on the Israelites as he had. The story of Ruth makes it clear that it is the will of God for Gentiles to share in the covenant blessings of Abraham. And no small part of that inclusion is in this young Moabitess becoming the great-grandmother of King David. This verse then, chapter 4, verse 17, is the climax of the story for all of us who have read it since then. The naming of David as the grandson of the baby born to Boaz and Ruth. So, is the Lord kind? That is the charge that he was not that Naomi leveled against God upon her return to her native land of Bethlehem. This story answers that question, is the Lord kind, with a resounding yes. I mean, the the very eyes which as a child looked out upon grandmother Naomi, as an old man may have looked upon his grandson David, and the ears of old Obed may have heard the Lord's kindness sung of as it had never been sung of before. David himself would be the one who would one day compose songs about the Lord's hesed, his everlasting love, his kindness, as it's translated here in Ruth. Maybe he was so certain of it in part because he knew this story of Grandpa Obed's birth. In Psalm 36, 7, we read these words of David about the Lord. How priceless is your unfailing love, both high and low among men. Find refuge in the shadow of your wings. The word translated here, unfailing love, is a kindness we see in Ruth. Love that does not fail. That's God's kind of kindness. You know, Jesus taught that God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends his reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. God has given many blessings to all of us today, regardless of how we stand affected toward him. Are you grateful to God for those blessings? What thanks have you given him in return? My Christian friend, recognize God's kindness toward you in everything. Realize that God works everything together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God provides richly for us, doesn't he? He has for us here as a church in so many ways. I mean, one of the ways that sort of this story makes me think of is how many of us are from other countries. Praise God for the, the great little foretaste of heaven we get that in this one little local church we get to see Christians from, I think, pretty much every continent. Praise God for that. It's a little foretaste of what we'll have in heaven. God's kindness to us is so evident. He provides richly. Upon more careful consideration, it appears that God is exonerated from the charges that Naomi would level against him in bitterness. He was always working in faithfulness and for the good of his own, even if he was working quietly and invisibly to our eyes. Remember that even while she was complaining, there was Ruth by her side and there was the barley harvest laid out all around them. And there is a God who is both sovereign and sovereign. And kind. And there you have the story of Ruth. The book starts very down, but ends out very up. We move from death to life, from barrenness to fruitfulness, from emptiness to fullness, from curse to blessing, from bitter to sweet, from being in exile to producing the grandfather of a king. The very fact that this little story of Ruth takes place in Bethlehem is itself pregnant with meaning. It's moved from being a place of famine to being a place of fruitfulness. Bethlehem was the burial place of Jacob's beloved Rachel, and now it's where Obed and his son Jesse and his son David would be born. A few centuries after that, the Lord spoke through the prophet Micah, saying, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Hundreds of years later still, when Herod asked where the scripture said the Messiah was to be born, that was the scripture that was quoted. 
Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And so, when the fullness of time had come, God used the offices of the mighty Roman Empire to order a census so that people would return to their native town. So Joseph and his betrothed wife, Mary, who lived in the north of Israel in Galilee, had to go south to Bethlehem. And there in Bethlehem, Jesus was born. The only place in the New Testament where Ruth seems to be quoted is in Matthew chapter 1. And there it's in the genealogy. It's the last few verses in Ruth. It's the first few verses in Matthew. It's the genealogy. The Gospel of Matthew is really all about this story that begins in Ruth. It begins in chapter 1, verse 1. This is the Gospel about Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And it concludes in chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus sending his disciples out to make disciples of all nations. That's the story of Ruth, completed on in the ministry of Jesus we see in Matthew's gospel. So God worked through Boaz not just to redeem Ruth and Naomi, but to bring about the great Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who would redeem us not just from earthly worries, but from the most serious worries we can possibly imagine, our worry about being lost in our sins. You know, I said we're made in the image of God, and we are, but we've all fallen. We've all sinned against God, and God in his great love has not left us to have sold ourselves into slavery to sin forever. He has, in great love, sent the Lord Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life, owing no penalty for his sins, having no sins. But yet he died on the cross for us, for you and for me, whatever kind of Moabitish gods we may have served. He has died for us if we will turn from our sins and trust in him. We'll know forgiveness from our sins and new life in Christ. Jesus Christ will be our redeemer. If you are here as my brother and sister in Christ this morning, we have surely seen God's kindness, haven't we? He has been good to us. Ephesians 2, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 30. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him? Graciously give us all things. Has God not been good to us? Who have certainly been more obnoxious to his holiness than any Moabite ever was. I mean, if you look at our lives and the way we live with all we know, are we not undeserving recipients of God's grace? And yet he has been good to us. He has been kind to us. In the middle of our complaining, he continues to bless us. There is Ruth, the way he was blessing. There is the barley harvest. Our sovereign and loving Lord is there and providing. So remember that when, like Naomi, you are tempted to doubt during bad times, remember that God provides. And, friend, God exposes the depths of our needs. He lets us go through those trials in order to show the fullness of his provision. God digs deep when he means to build high. We know that from our lives, and we know that from the word. Do you see something of the depth of your sins this morning? Do you realize that you are left yourself lost in sin? Then hear this great good news of the kinsman redeemer that we all need. Peter writes, you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. Amen.